Good morning and uh, welcome to this webinar all about the Content Connector. My name is Jennifer Schmidt and I'll be going over this very exciting webinar with you today. Today we are using um, our events module uh, by WebEx. So all the participants on the call have been muted, but I'd still like you to ask questions. So if you do have a question, please type a question in the chat box below and we'll answer it um, up in the um, chat. A little bit about myself. Um, my name is Jennifer Schmidt and I'm a member of Therefore's media team. I'm going to try to answer all the questions that you might have, but if I do miss something or if you're watching a recording, please uh, email us at media at therefore.net. So before I get started, let's just quickly go over some of the FAQs. Yes, this webinar is being recorded and you can of course have the slides and recording afterwards. We'll put all the um, recordings up on our YouTube channel, which is there for TV, as well as our extranet. And I'd also like to encourage all of you to follow us on social media. We've got Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, where we're relatively active. So um, just to get started, what is, uh, the, what is the Content Connector? Well, the Content Connector is um, a monitoring service that can monitor folders, mailboxes, as well as, um, didn't go all, all the way in, there you go. It can monitor folders, mailboxes, and um, signatures to see if anything comes in, extract the information, and then save it to Therefore. Once it's in Therefore, you can configure workflows and more. It supports CSV files, PDF, emails, attached documents, and more. So in sum, the content connector can do a lot of the boring yet important time intensive work of monitoring folders, saving and indexing information, and then putting it into therefore. So the benefits of the content connector are fantastic. It's one of those set it and forget it things. You set up the content connector once and it just runs. It will take the pertinent information and save it to therefore for you. And then once it's in Therefore, you have all the benefits of Therefore to make sure that the work gets processed correctly. It's consistent and dependable. And most importantly, it frees up employees' time for more productive, fulfilling tasks. This can actually increase employee happiness and save you money. Employees no longer need to be using their valuable time and resources to extract information manually, save it to Therefore, remember to check certain folders, remember to check certain emails, the content connector does it. And just think of that value that you have then in those employees' times. I mean, it happens so frequently that highly qualified employees, accountants, um, financial controllers, spend hours of their day every day just copying and pasting information from one system to another. Why don't you let the content connector do that instead and free up that employee to actually do productive, strategic work that they really enjoy? So the goals of my webinar today are to provide a good understanding about the purpose and capabilities of the Content Connector. I'll show you example use cases, and I want you to leave this webinar today with being very, very confident in talking about the Content Connector, be able to identify situations where it's a good solution, and be able to start a conversation with your colleagues, with your customers, about how to use it. But today, just to be clear, we will not cover scripting, indexing profiles, or the particularities of different e-signature providers. That's a little bit too technical for um, my purpose today. If you do have questions about that, please contact our pre-sales team, which is presales at therefore.net. So when we're talking about the contact connector, what kind of scenarios are we actually talking about? Um, we're going to be talking about invoices being created as PDFs in the ERP system, and they need to be saved to therefore. Payroll slips need to be saved and indexed to therefore. PDF A3 invoices need to be automatically created or saved. Orders from a web form arrive as an email and need to be saved to therefore. You automatically want to save documents signed with an e-signature, or you want to save all kinds of documents from a cloud sharing app to therefore. Obviously, other solutions are also possible, but um, we're going to be looking at some of these general scenarios in detail. So when we're talking about the um, contact connector. When can you actually use it? In general, it's always a very good situation when you have similar types of documents in the same file format being saved in the same location. For example, 
an ERP system creates invoices um, to be sent to your customers, so outgoing invoices. Obviously, they all have the same format. They're all the same type of document, namely invoices, and they're all being saved in the same file folder. And you want to save those into therefore. That's a very clear scenario where the content connector will absolutely shine. Um, a different situation is when you have different types of documents in different file formats being saved to the same location. And that's not a red situation where first stop. I've made it orange because it's a little bit of a trickier situation. In this case, if you find that you have different types of documents in different file formats, it's a little bit trickier, so I'm calling it orange. You're going to have to consider the situation a little bit closely. So either um, you can perhaps improve the situation by pre-sorting the documents a little bit more, um, by using more intense scripting um, to sort out the documents before and as they're being saved, or perhaps adjust, adjust the expectations and extract less information. So what do you need in order to use the content connector? You need two licenses, a therefore license, which is therefore online, or a work group or hire, as well as a content connector license. Then on the configuration side, you'll need to configure a category for saving the information, an indexing profile, and the content connector profile. So how does the um, content connector work? The content connector uses an indexing profile to define what should be saved, where the index data should come from, and which category the information should be saved in. Once the indexing profile has been defined, the content connector profile can determine what should be monitored and which profile should be used. So although uh, each situation is slightly different, I believe that we can generally summarize the configuration steps in five following steps. The first step is, of course, to analyze the documents that you want to save to there for. You need to identify what information you want to save and where on the page that information is located. Then you create a category and therefore for that information. And just like in any other situation, you want to use best practice in creating the category. So if you want to save a date, make sure to use a date field. If you're wanting to save a money amount, you want to save an integer field. And if it's text, you want to use a text field, etc. That's very important because chances are, once that information is in there for, you'll probably want to be using um, like a workflow to further processes, right? And so it's very important to always use best practice for your categories. Then you create an indexing profile and you select the profile based on the document type. Then you set up the folder or mailbox to be monitored and you want to create folders for processed and faulty documents. So processed and faulty documents refer to the documents that are coming from that original source um, that are going to be going into the therefore system through the content connector. And you can either say that the documents, once they've been processed by the content connector, should be moved to the processed folder, or they can be, just be deleted from the original source. Um, and most importantly, you also want to have a folder for faulty documents in case any documents cannot be processed. Um, the content connector will not delete them. There'll be a folder um, available where you can go back and check to see what information uh, wasn't actually saved. And then finally, you configure the content connector and set the polling interval. The polling interval just refers to the amount of time in between the checks. So the content connector can be set to check for perhaps every 10 minutes. Um, that's the standard. Every 10 minutes, the content connector will just check to see is there anything in that folder. If there is, it'll save it to therefore, and if not, it'll just poll again in 10 minutes. One important difference to note is the input folders. So the input folders refer to where that information is coming from originally. When using Therefore Online, um, Therefore Online input folders must be via FTP. The FTP connection is provided by the Therefore support team when the tenant is created. Um, and you can use an FTP site manager such as FileZilla to connect to the tenant's FTP site. Then just make sure the information gets onto that FTP and then the contact connector can suck it up and save to therefore, uh, just like anything else. Similarly, if you're using an on-premise system, the folders must be accessible to the content connector. And so always just check where's the content connector installed, can it access the folder that you want to monitor. And here's a simple screenshot of the FTP folder. So you can see here, I have 
a folder here for invoices and I have faulty and processed. So now that we've gone over very briefly um, a little bit of an introduction and a little bit of background about the contact connector, let's go into the actual demos and the actual configuration. So like I said before, I'm going to do a little bit of light configuration, a little bit of light demos here. Just to give you an idea of how it works, I'll first show you the PowerPoint slides. And then after I show you the slides and the PowerPoint for each example, I'll then go on to my live system and show how you it's set up on the live system here. So we'll go over how to save PDF doc documents, how to use barcodes, PDF A3 invoices, mailbox monitoring, um, cloud storage devices, as well as signature monitoring. So first, what we'll do is look at PDF documents. So traditional PDF documents. And here with the PDF documents, um, if you want to extract information from that PDF, you're going to be using Zonal OCR. And to use that, the most important step is to carefully analyze where that key information is located. Is it located consistently on that page? And if so, you can um, actually just use Zonal OCR to extract the information um, directly off the page. So here's a screenshot. I have a data extractor type PDF because it's a PDF document. And then I just drew a box around the number invoice number that I wanted to extract. Let's go have a look what this looks like on the live system. All right, so first step what we're going to do is we're going to open up the Therefore Solution Designer. I've already gone ahead and configured the categories. So for the first one that we're going to do is we're going to look at the PDF. So I have a category here, PDF Simple Invoice. Now all I want to extract is an invoice number and invoice date. So I'll be opening up my um, PDF document here. And this is what it looks like. So you can see it's just a very simple, regular PDF. And if I go through the samples here, you can see that the invoice number is consistently in the same spot which tells me that this is a good candidate for using OCR. So I've created the PDF simple invoice using best practice for category design. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a indexing profile. So going to my indexing profile, I have a folder here just for my content connector profiles. Again, I'm going to open up my invoice right here. All right, so the way it works is, again, I have a profile name. To make things easy for myself, I've chosen the same profile name for my category, my indexing profile, and then ultimately also my contact connector profile. By having consistent names across every single profile, I'll know exactly which profile goes with what, and it'll just make it a lot easier. So that's my number one tip is if you can, pick a consistent naming schema and stick with it because then when you need to go back and make changes, it'll be very, very clear to you what goes with what. If you have a naming schema that's not identical, if you're using a category name that doesn't match up with the um, indexing profile name, which doesn't match, match up again with the content connector, you might have trouble remembering which one you used for which purpose. So um, the data extractor, what we have here is a PDF data extractor. And when we go here, It'll open it up and the sample that's used is just based on what we select. Oops, no, I don't need an invoice. We need a PDF. And so as you can see here, the sample right here, um, we automatically just draw a box around it and that's the invoice number and we name it and say, okay. Then again, we could have a second extract right again here. And based on the sample, again, we just simply draw a date. We just click the mouse and it will save the date there. And as you can see here, what's very interesting is it'll actually um, have show you a preview of the information. And so then you can actually check is that information correct or not. In this case, actually, it was extracting 
the semicolon. We've removed that now, and now it's um, just extracting the date. So that's the first option. Then after configuring that, we need to go into the content connector. Then we have an input folder. And in my case, my demo system is on there for online. So what I've had to do is I've got connection to there for online. I received the connection details from the support team when this tenant was created. And here I have files, uh, folders on the FTP and for the PDF um, invoices, I have again, faulty and process. So let's go back to my input folders, my PDF invoices. And so the input folder is just invoices it's a local network because it's local to where the server is located, therefore online. It's a pro profile. I have two folders, process and faulty. Another option would be to move the folders into the, to just delete them rather than moving them into the process folder. Um, and the polling interval here for demonstration purposes is one minute, um, but the default is 10 minutes. All right, so what we're going to do now to demonstrate if it works or not is we're going to go back to the FTP. We are going to put a couple of invoices here. All right. And now we're going to open up the console and check if it works. And we've got one, two, three, four. And status is okay. Looks like that works well. So now we can go into our navigator and see if the documents have been saved. All right, they opened up on the other screen. Uh, here we go. And we will now go over here. We will look at the simple invoices. And there you go invoice date and the invoice number have been extracted in my sample documents. All right, let's go move on now to the next example with barcodes. Now, previously I mentioned that when you're using zonal OCR, uh, you have to make sure that the information consistently stays in that same spot. One thing that you can do to increase the accuracy and consistency of data extraction is to also use barcodes. Barcodes can be added automatically, for example, from the ERP system or manually, and therefore supports many types of barcodes, including QR codes. I'm going to show you an example of using um, barcodes on a PDF document, how that works with the content connector. And the barcode that I'll be using is um, three of nine, but like I said, any other type of barcode can be used. If you have a question specifically about different barcodes, please contact our pre-sales team. So what we have here is we have, again, we have a PDF, we have a profile name for invoices with barcodes. We're going to be using a barcode, an OCR data extractor. So like before, again, we'll be doing um, simple zonal OCR. But in addition to that, we're also going to be doing a barcode. So um, the system actually will recognize the barcode type automatically. And then using um, the scripting here, we can tell which tell it which um, characters in the barcode you want to extract. In this case, um, it starts at the ninth character and extracts for five characters thereafter. Let's go look at that in the live system. All right, so as we saw in the uh, PowerPoint just now, um, barcodes can be used to help extract the and increase the accuracy and the information it's available. Because OCR is, can be a little bit finicky, 
barcodes are a great way to kind of increase the accuracy and the availability of data because it is a format that is more friendly for machines to read. So let's go look at our sample document here. We have a barcode right here. And what we want to do with this barcode is we want to extract the order number here, OR002. How are we going to do that? Well, as before, we are going to create a um, category first. So we have a PDF barcode category which has an order number. Then we're going to create a indexing profile. And for this one, and this sample here, I have data extractor again, that is going to use the OCR plus the barcode. And when we go here, we can see we have OCR zones extracting the invoice date, invoice number, and the balance due, and we have a barcode to extract the information from the barcode. So what are we going to do? We are going to go again, find a sample document, which is this one here. And what it does is it loads the document. You can see here in the preview, you can actually also zoom in with the little thing. And all you have to do is double click a barcode to upload the barcode properties. And then what you do is you select a name, which is called barcode. It automatically identifies the barcode type, which is in this case three of nine. And you can also tell here that the test data is able to extract the test data here. Um, then based on this information, we can then use scripting to extract any specific type of information. And in this case here, the order number was what we wanted to extract. We use scripting here to extract starting at the ninth character for five characters long. And that's why it's important to analyze where the information is on the documents that you are saving so that you can create good indexing profiles. You can extract exactly what you want and when you need it. And again, for help with the scripting, uh, that's not something that we'll cover today because it's a little bit of a too broad topic but please feel free to talk to our pre-sales team to have any questions be answered. Cool, so then we've got our indexing profile and you know what's next. Say it with me, it's time for the Content Connector profile. So we're gonna go into the Content Connector profile here. I have a profile just for the PDF barcodes and we select the profile. Then in this case, um, I have decided to delete the files after successful processing, so I don't have a processed folder, but I do have a faulty folder. And looking onto our FileZilla, I really should upload, uh, update, date it. Um, let's connect again to our there for online. And this is where I would put the document. So let me put a document in here. And then we will check again to see if it's been saved. And ta da! There it is. So index data, again, it's extracting the order number OR002. So another option to increase the accuracy and the amount of data. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint now. So now that we've talked a little bit about traditional, simple PDFs, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about PDF A3 documents. PDF A3 documents are an, a relatively new format of PDF that enables other files to be embedded within that PDF, such as XML files. Um, technically speaking, also CSV files could also be, for example, be embedded within that PDF, 
but we're going to be dealing with um, PDF documents that have an XML format embedded because that is the type of PDF A3 that is most commonly seen in business processes. Um, the huge advantage of PDF A3 is that it's a format that's both machine readable and human readable. The human readable element is the PDF that's nicely formatted and that has the fancy colors and you know looks really nice. But the machine readable part is the XML document that's associated with that PDF. Um, and there are several different well-known PDF A3 standards that are especially common in the invoicing process. In Germany, the standard is called the Zugfett standard. In France, it's the Factur X, which is also used with the core system. Um, there's also a cross invoice industry standard, which is part of the UN. In any case, the huge advantage of PDF A3 is that because it's both machine readable and human readable, it allows um, invoices to be sent in this format in a way that can be automatically indexed. So what we can do is humans can read the invoice because it's a PDF, but then the machines, such as our contact connector, can extract all relevant information using the associated XML file. Moreover, um, if you have several suppliers who are sending invoices in the same PDF A3 subtype, for example, the Zugfeld 2.1 standard, you can, you can um, create one uh, profile for, for example, the Zugfeld inverses, and regardless of what the PDF physically looks like, you'd be able to extract the information from all invoices of that subtype. Um, regardless of where the data is located on the PDF, because remember, we'd be using the XML to actually machine extract the information. And that's a huge advantage. So it's extremely consistent, it's extremely efficient, and it works really, really well. Um, so my recommendation would be that if you live in a country such as Germany or France, where um, these PDF A3 standards are more common, Go ahead and talk to your suppliers. See if they're already producing PDFs in that standard. Perhaps they are, because then you could use the contact connector to really quickly and efficiently extract and index um, those invoices. So it's really cool. Let's talk a few words about how to handle um, setting up the PDF A3. So first step is that you need to open up the PDF A3 in um, regular programs such as Adobe. And you'll see that there is, when it opens up, that there is a link document in that PDF. You'll need to save the XML file for configuration separately. So save both the PDF and the XML file. Then what we do is we have set up two data extractors within the indexing profile. We set up the PDF um, and tell it to look for that XML. We use the star to say it's a wildcard. So as long as it's an XML file, we'll take it. And then we need to add an XML data extractor where a script is associated with it. Um, and for this, we'll, I ask you to please talk to your pre-sales team for help with scripting. I'll show you on my system what it looks like, but again, for help with the scripting, please talk to our pre-sales team. And so again, we have a PDF attachment here, and the attachment name in that PDF will be the XML file that contains all of the um, index that you want. Um, the next one that we're looking at now is PDF A3. This is a much more complex data extraction. The scripting needed for PDF A3 is much more significant. But my goal in showing you this demo right now is to give you an understanding of how configuration would work. And moreover, most importantly, to really give you a good understanding of what the benefits are of using the content connector, in particular with PDF A3. So, um, PDF A3 is a um, standard. Again, there's many different types of PDF A3. We're going to be dealing with one particular type of PDF A3 document, which is the 2.1 Zugfeld standard. So um, let's open up a sample document. This is a sample document in the Zugfeld 2.1 standard that I got from the website. And when you open it up, um, one thing that's really interesting is that you'll see that it's, you get a notification here from Adobe, um, and it also has an attachment. 
if you look at the uh, file attachment, it has an XML document here attached. Um, factor X is the same standard as SOAPFED 2.1. Unfortunately, there's many substandards, so it's always important to really confirm with what version of which standard are you working with because there might be differences. So if we open this up here, you can see, and this is just notepad, this is wrote this here, you can see that we have the standard XML tags. And we can see here that um, this is where the index information would be located. So when we go to configure um, an indexing profile for this type of document, we're gonna be using two. We're gonna be using one, a PDF um, indexing profile, as well as for XML documents. So again, we'll start with the PDF A3. So we have just three simple index fields, a buyer name, an invoice date, and a total sum. Of course, in a productive in system, you'd probably want to be extracting more. So you'd want more index fields, but for demonstration purposes, it's very simple. Then we have our indexing profile here. And all right, so when we open up the PDF A3 indexing profile, we can see we have a PDF data extractor and an XML data extractor. And the script that we would need looks like this. The pre-sales team will be very happy to help you. And you can also evaluate the script, which is a nice function here, and it will actually um, highlight in red any issues and any errors there are, so that's a good way of checking your code. Then based on that, you can then um, match up your fields, your category fields with the assignment, and then you can also even test it too. So if you do have a um, sample document, you can test it there. And then like always, you want to um, set up the content connector profile. And then finally also test it. All right, so moving now on from PDF to CSV documents. CSV, I have a couple file examples here of what a CSV file looks like. Generally, um, this is what a CSV file looks like. It's just a long string of information that's separated either by a colon or a semicolon. And when we set up a um, profile for the CSV documents, we want to specify the type of delineator used to separate the data. And then once you set that up, you then just go ahead and set up an indexing profile and a content connector profile, just like before. So let's go have a look what it looks like in the live system now. The first things that we're going to do is we're going to check out our data that we have here. And let me just open this up really quick. Opened up on the other screen. Here it is. So here you can see here, this is our um, CSV file. As you can see here, it's just a long list of um, names and contact information. And at the very first line are the headers with the first name, last name, etc. So this is what we're gonna be using to organize the data. So once again, I'll quickly show you what our Oops, sorry. We have what I'll quickly show you um, what it looks like. In this case, we have a case with all the contact information here. So as you can see here, this is our case. And then we also have categories underneath. And there's the birth, the birth certificates is the subcategory of the case where we want that information about the people to be stored. Then we next have an indexing profile. And here we have an indexing profile for the CSB, the citizen case management. 
And what we can see here is because we're using a CSV file, we're going to be using a text line data extractor. And if we were to open this up, we can then go to our CSV records and open up our sample document here. And as you can see here, the preview shows all of the lines of data that we have here. And the delineator, as you can see here, is the comma. One thing that's um, really noteworthy is that if there's a file um, that has some sort of error or some it's corrupted in some way, the preview will not work. That happened to me while I was preparing the demos for the webinar. Um, and that was a good test to show that there's an issue with the file itself. Um, so please always make sure you use the preview to see if the data can be read by the content connector or by the indexing profile. And then here you go, here's the sample, and then we can test. And you can see here that actually the, um, all the information here has been read correctly. Say OK. And um, the script that we're using, we'll just quickly open it up. And what we're actually going to be doing is we're going to actually be generating a new case per um, person. And uh, that's something that the pre-sales team can help in detail with. Then as before, we'll look at the um, input folders, the CSV. So again, the input folder is going to be, for me, um, on FTP because I am using there for online. The profile is going to be the indexing profile. The filter is .csv. I got two um, folders again, processed and faulty, and I can also change the polling interval. And then when I open up the file in our um, navigator, I can then see that every single record generated here is its own category. So it's just another example of what's possible. And because there's no data actually in this, when it opens up, it looks like this. So it's generating its own little form here. And that's also done through the scripting. So a lot is possible with scripting. Uh, please talk to your uh, pre-sales team. They're more than happy to help you make your dreams a reality. All right, so now we're gonna move on to another type of um, data extra extraction, and that's gonna be mailbox monitoring. So mailbox monitoring um, allows you to automatically monitor an email inbox. You can save and index emails and their attachments with the content connector. And we support a wide range of different email providers, including Exchange, as well as IMAP servers, which um, IMAP servers is just a general broad term for e all email providers such as Gmail, Yahoo, and others. So it's a very, very useful. Um, a typical scenario where a mailbox monitoring could be used would be, for example, a mailbox uh, where you get only orders that come from a form. In that case, you know exactly where the data is and you can easily extract it. Or it could also be used for emails, um, email accounts which aren't addressed to a specific person but still need to be monitored. For example, if you have an email address uh, where you get a lot of just contact forms or you get complaints, you want to make sure that that gets followed up with. And in that case, you could uh, ha monitor that mailbox and then set up a workflow to make sure that any complaints are handled in a really timely and good manner. So it's, again, a really neat way to increase efficiency, save time, and um, just save employees the hassle of continuously checking mailboxes where they don't necessarily get emails um, all the time or where the emails aren't sent to a specific person to avoid um, issues where you don't know exactly who it's responsible for. So mailbox monitoring is very, very useful. With mailbox monitoring, how does it work? You create a category to save the emails. You want to be very clear what information do you want to save from the emails. Do you want to save content from the email text itself or just information such as the sender, date, and subject line? Sender, date, and subject line are going to always be on that email, so it doesn't matter what the email text or contents look like because that will be always available. Um, you can also add filters to exclude certain emails. And keep in mind that many email programs such as Outlook already have very, very um, advanced um, Outlook rules 
and uh, abilities to filter emails in a certain way. So using the rules um, and folders in your email allows you to do a lot of pre-sorting so that if you only want to save certain emails, you can already create a folder that only allows certain emails to be saved in it, um, directly in that email provider. Then um, you create the mailbox monitoring profile um, and define process and faulty folders in the mailbox, so in the email provider. And from then on, um, it's very easy. I'll show you what it looks like now in my test system. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at the mon mailbox monitoring. First things first is you're going to open up a um, email. For uh, demonstration purposes, I've decided to open up um, a Gmail account because Gmail is a free service. Everyone knows it, everyone has access to it. So I feel like it's a good example because we all can practice with this. Um, and what I've done here is I've created two folders here in Gmail, faulty and processed. And as you can see here, my processed folder has all the emails in it um, because I set this up a while ago and all the emails that have been coming into this email system have just been getting saved into there for. Um, and obviously because this is not an email system that I use very often, most of the emails here that I'm writing are actually um, just uh, from Dropbox or other accounts. But what I will do uh, for demonstration purposes is I'm going to go ahead and send an email now um, to this email account just from um, our media in inbox. This is the easiest way to demonstrate how it works. So this is going to be therefore corporation, therefore corporation at gmail.com. All right, so it goes into the inbox. All right, so we've got an email coming through. So let's go look at the configuration while we wait for the email to be sent and to be processed. Um, first things first, of course, I have a category where I want the emails to be saved. In my case, it's going to be mailbox monitoring. And because the mails that are coming into that um, Gmail account are non-structured, we know that we can't retrieve any of the message contents. Okay, but we can retrieve things that are the same for all emails, which is the sender, subject, email date, and sender email. Then I have an indexing profile. Again, sender, subject, email, date here. And the assignment here, there's no scripting involved. These are just drop down. I just select what I want from the drop down list. Then the input folder is going to be mailbox monitoring. And so when I create a mailbox monitoring, I have to authenticate that email um, address to the therefore system. And so here I have to add the settings in here, the username, password, server, port, security. All of this information can actually be found quite easily using just a simple search on the internet if you're not sure exactly what should be done. Um, for IMAP servers, you're going to make sure that you select the IMAP for. If you're using Microsoft Exchange, you use Exchange Web Services. Uh, so that's quite simple. And then I have two folders here, process and faulty. Um, just write like this, no um, backslash or anything like that. Um, and that's it. So we can then go check out the console to see what's going on. Start the scheduler. And so looking at the console, we can see that the email has already been processed. Let's see here if anything has come in to our 
Yeah, that's monitoring. Oops, wrong category. And there you go, it already, it already had processed it. It was so fast, look at that. There you go, test from Jennifer. You saw me send that email earlier. And here it is. A wonderful test from Jennifer. So, <laughs> so as you can see here, Mailbox Monitoring, it's just been sucking up all the emails that are getting sent. It works great. Highly recommend it. It's super fast to configure. Um, I can think of so many use case scenarios where it would be great to get emails from a certain mailbox or a certain subfolder of a mailbox and have them all saved to there for so that they can be processed with a workflow. So super useful. And of course, email attachments can also be saved. And for doing email attachments, you just use an indexing profile for the type of file that's attached. So for example, if emails consistently have a, um, an invoice, PDF A3, you would then configure um, an a indexing profile for the PDF A3 documents like I showed you previously. Moving on now, um, the next type of document that a, um, the content connector can save is for cloud storage devices. So what are cloud storage devices and what do I mean with it? So when we're looking at cloud storage devices, um, we're thinking of a, these increasingly popular cloud storage places um, where users can upload and download documents to shared cloud storage. Therefore offers out of the box integrations with OneDrive, Dropbox, Box.com, as well as Google Drive. And this allows, therefore, in the cloud storage provider to seamlessly up and download documents. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that once a document is out of therefore, therefore no longer has control of the document, which will compromise the security and audit cap capacities. So for this reason, we recommend using cloud sharing only for documents which aren't um, very sensitive. For example, like a marketing document. A use case could be, for example, that you use, you create text for a brochure, it's edited and approved within Therefore. And then once it's been approved for publishing, um, at the final stage of that work workflow, it's um, uploaded for sharing with the graphic design agency. So the graphic design agency then has access to a cloud storage. They take the text, they put that um, text into a brochure, and then they save the brochure as a PDF back onto cloud storage and that's then automatically downloaded and saved back into Therefore using our content connector integration. So some technical information here about the cloud storage. Um, again, we're going to show you an example. I'll show you an example using Google Drive. So we'll have a folder structure created in Google Drive um, for faulty and processed. And we'll also have another folder, export and import. Again, because we want to be exporting things to Therefore from the perspective of Google Drive as well as importing folders from Therefore. And then um, in the cloud storage section, we want to create a new cloud storage device. Then we have to authenticate the credentials to allow Therefore to access the cloud storage. In our case, it'll be Google Drive. We then create a new indexing profile to import the files. We match the category fields to the available file object properties. Um, and then in, um, in the example I'll be showing, I'm going to be saving all types of file documents. Um, just to give you an example of what you can do if you have different types of documents being saved to the same folder that you want to monitor. And then you create a new input folder. And the input folder will be a cloud drive. So it's actually very easy to set up. And let's take a look at that now. All right, to show you cloud storage, we're going to be going back to our um, Google account that we had previously used. We'll open up Google Drive. And as you can see here, we have several folders here on Google Drive. And we have two folders here, import and export. Um, so export 
is for exporting things from Google Drive. For importing things, um, we're going to be making two folders again, process and faulty. We set this up a while ago, so I have a folder here where we have all our process documents. And so as you can see here, the uh, folder that I'm using um, has all different types of documents in it. Um, anything from Word documents to PDF and also Excel documents are also in here. So this is a folder which has been monitoring all different types of documents. And because you know these types of documents are all different, the big key here is that we won't be able to extract any document contents. If you knew that all the documents were formatted, we could again be using um, one of the techniques described earlier to extract contents from the document. But in this case, we're going to be looking at extracting um, information that's common to all the documents, which is going to be probably the date of upload, file name, file type. So let's look again at our solution designer to see what we have here. I have a folder for Google Drive with a category. I have the file name, the file extension, and the creation date. Then again, I have a indexing profile. And this one is just called import profile. And just like with mailbox monitoring, I have a category field. And I'm just using the drop down list here um, to get this information file name, file extension, file creation. And then finally, I have the content connector profile. And what the input folder this time is going to be a little bit different. So the folder type is going to be Google Drive. We can also create a new storage, cloud storage. And in this case, you would create the name, the cloud storage provider. We have a list of our uh, supported providers. Um, then you enter the name and then click on authenticate. At that moment in time, an email will be sent to the um, provider where you will need to authenticate through that cloud storage provider that therefore is allowed to access with the username and email. It goes really fast. Um, then just as before, you set up uh, folders for faulty and processed, adjust the polling interval, and you're good to go. Uh, and then it will just select all the documents that you have there before. So that's a really pretty simple one. And finally, when we talk about different types of monitoring, the final one that I'm going to be talking about is e-signatures. So first of all, before I go into the depth of how um, the content connector can work with e-signatures, well, let's talk about what is an e-signature. So an e-signature is a legally binding electronic signature. It allows documents to be signed digitally rather than physically, which means that you don't have to print or mail any um, paper. It's 100% electronic. And for many businesses, especially businesses who have a lot of contracts to be signed up, it can save them a lot of time and also a lot of money. So it's a really fantastic option. And combined with um, our e-signature cap capabilities, I think a lot of customers uh, could really benefit from using e-signature signatures, um, especially in this time of um, social distancing. It's time of where we're all staying a little bit more home, where it's a hassle to go to the post office. Um, this is really a great feature, and I think a lot of businesses are really going to be happy with it. So. We actually have a completely automatic and completely seamless solution for e-signatures. You create a contract, then using a workflow task, it's automatically sent to the e-signature provider. Um, and that e-signature provider then sends an email to the person who needs to sign the document. That person signs it from their um, home computer. That signature is saved by the e-signature provider. And then, um, the content connector jumps in, automatically monitors that folder where the e-signatures um, are provided, and saves that new signed document back to therefore. So it's completely seamless, it's completely automatic, and it saves so much time and hassle. No longer, if you didn't have that content connector monitoring that folder, an employee would physically have to go into the e-signature provider's um, portal and open it up to see if the document has been signed yet or not. And using the contact connector, it'll just automatically be saved right back to Therefore. And it's all in one swoop. So it's very, very, very efficient. 
and for many businesses um, who signed a lot of documents out, just imagine how much time and hassle this can save them. Instead of having to go to the mail the post office, you know, put the stamp, wait for the um, mail to arrive, they just send it out electronically. That person doesn't have to find a printer to print out the uh, documents, doesn't have to go back to the post office to mail it back. It's all done like that. So I love it. It's a great solution. And we have, um, like I mentioned before, we have out of, the, out of the box connectors for USign, SimpleSign, and DocuSign available now. We're also making additional connectors for more e-signature providers that will be out with there for 2020. Moreover, if you are using an e-signature provider for which we don't have a connector yet, we also have an agnostic, a provider agnostic interface, which means you can use our API to integrate with any e-signature provider that you like. All right, so again, let's talk about how to configure the signature monitoring in general, and then I'll show you how it's done um, using my demo system. So the first step is to configure the signature provider. Of course, every signature provider is a little bit different. Then you configure an indexing profile for a new signed document. Um, we recommend using auto append to, auto, to either, either append or replace the signed document to the original unsigned document. Because remember, the document origin will be within therefore. That will be the unsigned document. Then it gets sent out for signature. And when the document comes back into the therefore system, you'll want to save it in the same category, right? Um, so you can either append, so you have a, a signed and unsigned version, or you can just replace it, so you only have the signed version at the end. Then you can configure signing signature monitoring in the contact connector, so that the contact connector um, knows to look for uh, the, those signed documents. And you can also use scripting to check if the document was signed or not. If the document is returned as unsigned, you can also um, check for that and save it again in the same or a different category and then perhaps use a workflow to make sure to follow up with the signee as to why they didn't sign it. Um, again, just please be aware, each signature provider is slightly different. If you're interested in learning more about the specifics about each signature provider, please let me know. Um, our developer, Gunter, um, has been extremely um, helpful and has so much knowledge about this that he would be really more than willing to do a special uh, tech session with anybody who's interested in this. I also encourage you guys to go back and look at our experts update for version 23 because Grinter does go into the different signature providers a little bit more deeply there. So let's go have a look now on my live system to see how signature monitoring is set up. All right, so I'll be showing you how to configure the content connector for e-signature monitoring on this test machine here. Um, because this is where we have the credentials for the e-signature providers. So let's open it up and take a look. All right, first things first is um, we're going to be using a category, of course. So we've got a commercial lease agreement here based on what we need to extract from our fictitious lease. So we have here a agreement. Then we have a indexing profile. Um, in this case, we'll have simple sign here. Simple sign is going to be the signed document indexing profile here. Match it up to your categories. And you can also use um, macros, or you can also use a little bit of scripting to further extract information. And then finally, we also have to set up um, input folders for signature monitoring. And one important thing is the first step that you have to do is you always have to set up the e-signature provider, which is down here under the e-signatures node. And here you're just gonna be entering the name. It can be any name that you choose and enter your username and password or API key, depending on what is provided by the e-signature provider. I briefly had mentioned that uh, you can also automatically send documents for signing. And that's just done with a workflow task. I'll quickly show you, this has nothing to do with the content connector, but it is really worth mentioning because it is really cool. So this uh, workflow task 
simply takes documents that get saved to that lease category, automatically sends them out to be signed. So when sending for um, signing, you enter your e-signature provider, enter a subject for the email that will be sent. You can use macros. In this case, the subject will simply be the property address. And then add the information here and click OK. In this case, the workflow then ends. And that's the whole thing to it. When an email comes into, um, when, excuse me, when a new document is saved into the category, this will trigger the start of the workflow. The document will be then sent to the signatory to be signed. They will receive an email in their email provider, um, such as Gmail, where they can simply open up the document, sign it, and then it will be automatically saved back to there for as a signed document. And so we've actually gone ahead and had this configured. So here is a um, commercial lease agreement. And you can see here it adds a second page here where you can see that the person signed it. It was a fictitious person. And um, then it saved and replaces the original unsigned document. And that's it. All right, now that we've seen some of the most common use case scenarios for the content connector, let's talk about some tips and tricks. The first tip and trick is the more similar the data is, the more information can be easily extracted. Next one is use the rules and folders in your email provider to pre-sort emails if you don't want to save every single email from that email um, address. You can monitor the faulty folder and use the workflow to notify the admin when docs are faulty. So the input folder could actually also be a faulty folder. So you don't need to actually remember to go back and check the faulty folder. You can just monitor that with the content connector. And then when you do get uh, documents into the um, faulty folder, just use a workflow to notify somebody, hey, we got some faulty documents that weren't able to be saved by the content connector. Um, another, connect another common um, issue that we see is the content connector should be the only one to access the monitored folder during polling. So if you're using one folder where another um, third party software is saving documents into it, um, you can actually set the schedule so that the polling interval is different than the saving interval, just so that they don't interact with each other. Another really important issue is that you have to ensure the quality of the documents is good, especially if you're using OCR. So if you're using OCR, uh, you wanna make sure that the documents are optically very clear and can easily be read. Uh, similarly, any other type of document, make sure the files aren't being corrupted as they're being saved into the uh, folders. If you are using the content connector to save very large amounts of data in one chunk, um, the processing might be kind of slow. In that case, try to break down the amount of data into smaller chunks. For example, um, you could adjust the polling interval, or maybe if you're only polling the, polling the folder you know, once a day, you can change it to try and polling it a few, few times a day so that you're not getting such large amounts of data all at once. Another really important tip is that as the content connector is working, you can check the status in the console to see if, um, how that's doing. And you can see here, we actually are able to keep track of how many faulty documents um, are picked up as well. So in sum, I hope that this has been a really informative, educational, and also fun webinar. Um, that I know that we covered a lot of different topics and we got a lot of technical information today, but if there's one thing that you walk away with today, the message should be the content connector can help you increase your productivity accuracy and speed of processing information and saving it to therefore. It can help make your employees more happy, more productive, and increase the value in their work. So in conclusion, talk to your customers and colleagues today about how the Content Connector can help. And remember that a single Content Connector license can be used to monitor all kinds of folders and mailboxes. So it's a really great bang for your buck. 
uh, and let's go check the questions. Um, first question, yes, this webinar is recorded and you can have the slides and recording. So now that we've got that out of the way, um, I'm gonna go check the chat to see what kind of questions you guys have been asking. And as always, um, just stay in touch with us, sign up for our newsletter and send us an email if you have any, anything that you need. Thank you so much.